Welcome to the Climate Diplomacy Podcast, a podcast from the Berlin-based Think and Do Tank Adelphi, bringing you the latest insights and debates in international climate diplomacy and security. We are your hosts, Raquel Monayer. And I'm Alexandra Steinkraus. In this series, you will hear from experts and practitioners offering their take on climate foreign policy, climate-related impacts to security, and promoting peace and resilience in a changing climate. For more information, please visit climate-diplomacy.org or follow at Climate Diplo on Twitter. So welcome to episode 25 of the podcast. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into the Berlin Climate and Security Conference, which took place in person the 11th through 12th of October at the Foreign Office here in Berlin. And then a follow-up digital segment took place the following week in order to ensure broad participation on all levels and from all regions in order to bring together the broader climate and security community of practice. Today is actually Raquel's birthday, so she has a day off, and I'm happy that we have a bit of a different format, more of a conversation today. And I'm here with Alina Vihoff, one of the main organizers of the conference, to talk about the launch of the Climate for Peace initiative, key takeaways, and how this agenda for action can support an ambitious and successful COP. We're currently recording the podcast on Monday, the 7th of November. So COP has very much just started. To start with the basics of BCSC, who exactly are we bringing together for this conference? Yes, thank you, Alex. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to speak to you about BCSC and share our insights. As you already said, BCSC 22 conveyed quite a diverse group of people, all linked to the climate security community of practice, climate security experts, international organization, practitioners, but also especially during the in-person event, high level political actors. So we had this political segment, we'll talk about it in a minute, I guess, the opening ceremony where we launched the Climate for Peace Initiative and representatives including from Guinea, Pisao, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Gabon, Somalia, Niger, Kyrgyzstan, Czech Republic, Ireland, Finland, Norway, and of course our host Germany were present actually. And yeah, this is showing the wide range of actors. So Alex, maybe I just <laughs> gave a hint. Maybe you can explain further what the initiative is and how it got started. Yeah, of course. So the initiative was initially established by Germany during its G7 presidency. And in May of 2022, so not so long ago, the G7 foreign ministers, as well as the EU, committed to the initiative. So in addition to that would be the EU, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom, and finally the United States. Since then, Australia, Belgium, Finland, Indonesia, the Netherlands, and Spain have now also joined the initiative. So this is clearly by the fact that we've just named a lot of different countries, and this is getting to be a list podcast. Um, it's very multilateral by nature, and the goal of the initiative is to promote, coordinate, and advance concrete projects on the ground in order to address this gap between really strong political rhetoric and action, and further the progress generated by a lot of current joint initiatives that exist and ensure that climate security is a local and national priority. So, of course, the initiative is still relatively young, roughly five months or so. Future topics that will be explored include integration of climate data in conflict analyses, early warning systems, risk and foresight assessments, disaster risk reduction, adaptation, and as well as risk insurance and finance. And I guess if you're interested in a lot of these topics, all of the recordings from the live streamed and the open digital formats can currently be rewatched on Adelphi's YouTube channel, as well as directly on the BCSC website, which is berlin-climate-security-conference.com. 
climate.de. And you can also actually watch the launch of the Climate for Peace initiative, as well as 26, 20 something other yes. sessions. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. There's a lot of watching and rewatching that can be done. Yeah. Besides recording of our ceremony and the launch of the initiative, if you, our audience, happen to be at COP and you're interested to learn more about the initiative, Adelphi, represented by Alma Whitaker, actually hosting a panel discussion with the German Federal Foreign Office on Thursday, the 17th November, from 1.15 to 2.45 in Amon, area B, that will delve more into the detail of the initiative, discuss improve integration of peace building into climate action agenda and create a space for cross initiative consensus building and collaboration to improve climate security investment and action so mark your calendars if you're in Egypt yeah perfect okay so after this podcast there's a lot more further viewing both potentially in person and on people's screens that can be done so then getting back to the initiative, I think we've plugged all of the different further learnings that we can. The launch of the initiative was, of course, a really key part of the conference, important in bringing so many of these high level political actors together. And I'm super excited to see what comes out of the COP, specifically our event, of course, as well as the entire thing. But now I want to turn our attention a bit to some of the discussion that was happening during BCSC in October. And actually, our team here at Adelphi was able to identify consensus on what is needed to address interconnected global crises urgently, coherently, and within limited resource that we have. And we've generated six key takeaways. So of course, the impacts of climate change while they affect everyone, are distributed unevenly across the planet, and the power and resources to mitigate the effects of climate change are concentrated quite heavily in the hands of those most responsible for historic emissions. So our first key takeaway was that disproportionate impacts required a shifting of resources and knowledge exchange. So climate justice really needs to be at the center of conversations and actions moving forward. Yeah, I think that is really a key takeaway, but what does this actually look like in practice? What do you think? First and foremost, I think it means centering collaborative efforts around the communities and the people that are at the front lines of the crises. And it also means holistically supporting diverse, healthy, sustainable, and secure communities that are making sure that the solutions aren't band-aids being put on the problem, but are actually sustainable in practice. And I think that that is really the key here, is making sure that these things both address immediate impacts, but also are really future-oriented. I would totally agree. And building on community-focused collaborative efforts nicely links actually to our second key takeaway, which is joint approaches across sectors, nations, and communities are essential. In order for climate policy to be better mainstreamed into peace building and conflict resolution frameworks, more alliances are needed across sectors, different levels of governance, such as between EU, AU and the UN. But to date, capacities, structures and resourcing to enable alliances like this are still lacking. A positive example is actually the EU Group of Friends for Ambitious UA Climate Policy, which was discussed during BCSE and has since been launched. Actually, this would be a positive step, which is going into the right direction of advancing better coordination at a structural level. But I think there's still much to do on this end. And besides the importance of joint approaches that work across different governance, political, economic and social systems, Participants highlighted that these approaches still need to be context-specific and resonate on the ground in affected regions through collaborative action. I think this is really important to flag again here when it comes yeah. to joint approaches. Yeah, definitely. And I think 
We've obviously been talking a lot already about these multilateral initiatives, but also trying to focus on what that looks like in practice. And Global Shield from the German government, which was endorsed shortly after BCSC by the Ensure Resilience high level consultative group, was discussed quite a bit during BCSC, right? Yes, definitely. Actually, it was the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ, that hosted a session that addressed the gap when it comes to investing in early action and looked at different examples of it, including financial protection and preparedness plans like Global Shield, which they presented there, that will scale up best practices and like discussed during the first key takeaway, is directly tied to the responsibilities of industrialized countries for causing climate change and interlinked with the topic of climate justice, making sure finance insurance can be enhanced to better fit the needs of the most vulnerable. Yeah, I think it should come to no one's surprise that the topic of financing came up quite a bit during BCSC. And this goes to show that better financing and access to funds is absolutely key. And like I said, this was by far, I think, the most frequently raised challenge at the conference. And rather than focusing just on how much, how was really the most frequently asked question. And participants called for conflict-sensitive, climate-risk-informed, more predictable, and easier to access funds with less owner supporting tied to it to ensure that money actually reaches communities and not just national governments. And of course, there's also an unquestionable need for increased funding and investments for adaptation and loss and damage in fragile and conflict-prone areas, as well as early warning systems that take into consideration the interactions of climactic, political, and conflict dynamics, and overall better coordination between climate, peace building, and development is also incredibly necessary as is matching funding mechanisms and cycles to project realities on the ground that work with communities and not just for them, which I think is a key message that we keep coming back to, is making sure that even though actions are collaborative, that they really focus on the communities at the front lines of climate change. Definitely. I totally agree. And I think this shows, and also in our key takeaways, that main aspects are inclusivity, equity, and diversity. So it's already in there, but were there any additional points made in this topic that stood out for you, Alex? Yeah, I think amongst both the in-person and digital segments, there's a large demand for youth to be granted an elevated place in climate security strategies in order to promote things like intergenerational justice. And I think at COP and as well as in the field, we see a lot of youth envoys, representatives, delegations. And I thought that it was important to see that echoed in the conversations and the different panels at BCSC as well. Yes, I also think that the gender dimension of climate security is a very important topic, has been for a long time, but now it's moving more to the action side of things rather than the problem. A lot of nations, including Germany, are calling for feminist foreign policy, in particular our host of the BCSC, Minister Annalena Baerbock, and the meaningful inclusion and participation of women and girls at all stages. So not only looking at the problem side, but really looking at the empowerment of site and how can we change it and also use it as a benefit actually, or like a entry point to tackle the challenges ahead. And actually there was a Twitter discussion happening around this. And one of the BCSC participants, Esha Wundulu specified that this means from prioritizing action around the analysis by local women of the root causes of violence all the way to the decision-making of governance. So I thought this was a really important distinction. Yeah, definitely. Looking from all the way of these very local contexts 
to governance at the state level and beyond. So the topic of data and research, of course, came up quite a bit. Did the discussion surprise you at all? It did, actually, in a positive way. There were quite a few sessions that focused on it, both in the in-person part and the digital part. And I think overall, the takeaway has been that there is quite a lot of research happening already now, a new research, new data on climate security. Now, I think it's about centralizing and sharing data and research methods. And I think it's quite vital here to mobilize collective action and collaboration. And better analysis is also only useful as the ability and the will actually to use it and shape preventative action. Otherwise, it's, I wouldn't say useless, but I think it's really about targeting it and make it useful. So we need to ensure that quantitative data and qualitative realities on the ground are actually married so that they are fit for purpose. So field research, the engagement with local stakeholders is vital to ensure that early warning system climate security models are accurate. I think next year it would be really interesting to see what sort of examples are out there to see could we actually do this and translate it into early investment and anticipatory action? So we'll see how this goes. So now we are actually coming to our last key takeaway. And I think that's one I'm especially proud of here in BCSC is our approach to what climate security actually means. And the importance of stressing the need to send climate security around people and human security. And... Therefore, during the BCC, one of the more interesting, even though I think all of our things have <laughs> been interesting, is we did bring in the debate around hard and soft security to the forefront. And first in a session hosted by NATO, but also in the closing panel discussion and really think about the distinction and also the different ends or can we also maybe merge them? But Alex, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I think that this will be especially interesting what we come up maybe for next year, because I think one of the most open questions from this year that I'll be excited to revisit is how we can develop a common language for climate action and the security community. Since with climate-driven conflicts causing more deaths than traditional hard security dynamics, like terrorism in a lot of different regions, this line is being increasingly blurred. And a consensus has started to emerge that the cascading implications of climate change on peace first and foremost affect human security, which may sound rather soft to actors from security and stabilization sphere, but at scale it is systemically important. This recognition was echoed amongst a lot of key military stakeholders at the conference, and I think that this will really serve as the basis for this conversation going forward in the next year. Yes, I think it's really important to think about what is actually meant with security and framing it or basing our decision on human security will also like open up the doors for maybe traditional security actors, yeah. which we need to tackle the challenge ahead, actually, to include them. Yeah, but also during the closing session, this topic emerged. What mm -hmm. do you, from your perspective, what was a highlight during the closing session around this distinction? Yeah, I think like you already kind of hinted at the military's position in climate security was really under the spotlight during the session and the previous one with all these questions of are traditional military centered security models even compatible with emerging priorities like climate security and feminist diplomacy? Can the military be repurposed to face perhaps humanity's ultimate threat of climate change? And what is the role of the military in this new world? And also on the flip side, 
what is its potential to aggravate climate insecurity and its efforts to stabilize the international order. These are a lot of really big picture questions that we've only started to scratch the surface of. So definitely a lot of work to do in the next year and hopefully in the BCSC 2023 recap podcast or even one ahead of time, we'll be able to focus on some of these questions even a little bit more. But overall, I think it was really energizing to see these discussions taking place in real life, since of course this was kind of BCSC's big return to the in-person since its first iteration in 2019. So then to come to some of these questions about the how we did it, why was it important to do something like this in person this year? Maybe now moving from the key takeaways on the content more to the broader frame of BCSC. Doing it in person certainly added a bit of pressure for the planning. Also, I think as a climate and security conference, we asked ourselves a lot of <laughs> times, how can we justify bringing approximately 300 people to Berlin for two days? And I think everyone working in the international climate field is confronted with this dilemma of flying. Firstly, let me say, I think, I believe digital meetings are great. However, they cannot replace the value of face-to-face -face meetings, which open up the space for conversations, for exchange over a coffee after a session. And I think that's where the interesting things happen, where people really get in touch and share perspective. The in-person conference also offered opportunities for some site meetings besides the official program as people already were gathered in Berlin. That was one of the reasons why we tried to get the most out of it. During this year's conference, for example, the Climate Security Network, compromised of international climate security experts based around the globe, serving as a hub for research on the linkages between climate and security was able to meet for a working lunch. Also, the weathering risk partners, donors, supporters, all were able to meet in person to discuss first results from the initiative, from the field analysis so far, discuss ways in which our analysis is being used on the ground. So this was a great opportunity to really have in-person working meetings. And there was even an informal gathering of the G7 working group on climate security. So we really tried our best to get the most out of the opportunity of people actually meeting in person. But that being said, why was it important to hold a digital session from your perspective, Alex? I guess as a little behind the scenes, we did this kind of two-day in-person event. And then the week following, we had some digital sessions. I think we had a total of 12. And it was always kind of a question of, do we do both formats? Do we do one? Do we do the other? How do we move forward? And in terms of making sure that we had a digital segment of the event, I think there were two big reasons that stand out. And overall, those can be summed up as inclusivity and carbon emissions. So as much as we can be conscious about diversity of regions and sectors and representation of different genders and ages, a digital conference will always be more inclusive and also climate friendly. And on the inclusivity point, Research at the University of Texas, Austin, actually found recently that representation of women increased more than 250% with digital conferences, and similar numbers were also found for genderqueer people. And while we were able to somewhat avoid this in the planning of BCSC, since participation for the in-person segment was invitation only, and we did maintain some level of control over the guest list. So we had the ability to take care and make sure that there was gender equality among speakers and those attending, and we could do our best to ensure regional representation and other things like that. 
of course, with something like this, there's always some aspect that's a bit out of your hands. So I think it's always good to have a mix of these different formats. And you brought up a lot of good points about the value of doing these face-to-face -face meetings and squeezing in a lot of these meetings on the margins to kind of propel ambition forward. And I don't think that we'll ever see a future where everything is 100% digital or we completely move back to only in-person conferences. But I think we're moving towards a world where, and I think actually maybe we're already there, where people are becoming more conscious of their individual impact, especially for work, and are being a little bit more selective about maybe how many times they choose to travel for work a year. So I think it's really important that we continue to have options like the digital segment to complement in-person events. Because when it comes down to it, the carbon footprint of an in-person attendee is always gonna be much higher, even though digital infrastructure, of course, also has a footprint. But rather than having one or the other, I think in the future, there needs to be both. And there's a lot of learning and best practices out there for how to do it most successfully. To all the listeners, if you've brilliantly cracked the code on how to kind of balance this digital in-person without doing a hybrid that is maybe more stressful from all levels, please leave your tweets, write us. We're more than happy to hear all of your insights. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Let us know. I just wanted to add that for the sake of inclusivity, we also offered the possibility to join at least the main panels with live stream. So people were able to join the main panels at least with the live stream and you are able to rewatch it again. I think this is also one way to ensure inclusivity. However, doing hybrid session always comes with challenges, but I think this was definitely a good way to open up the conversation to a wider range of people. And one way what we discussed, Alex, is an idea also to move BCSC maybe to different regions. Maybe it's not called BCSC, but have a climate security conference in totally different area where we can really ensure inclusion of affected communities. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. I guess BCSC then in some point, maybe we can have iterations without the B. But that's a good point. We've kept highlighting multiple times and reinforcing the point that these community-centered, like locally driven responses are incredibly important. And of course, the best way to get people from affected communities and affected regions to these kinds of settings and conferences is to bring it directly to them. So hopefully, maybe this can be our prediction for the future, that the next time we talk about a climate security conference, we'll be sharing experiences from different countries, different regions, different communities as well. Sounds like a great plan. Yeah. So before we wrap things up, now like we mentioned, COP is actually here. So what should we be on the lookout for? I think we need to commit to climate and conflict sensitivity for COP and beyond. We are hoping to see self-commitment amongst all parties on climate and conflict sensitivity. Donor states and financing mechanism could or should, should we say, commit to systematically assessing if all projects, programs, and strategies are climate sensitive and sustainable. And the international climate community also needs to ensure that humanitarian and stabilization programming take the current and incoming impacts of climate change into account for building peace and resilience in a world changed by climate change. So participants at BCSC also agreed on the need to ensure that climate policies agreed on at COP are conflict sensitive. This means avoiding that marginalized groups are asked to bear the biggest burden of adapting. It implies foregoing conflict-blind solutions 
such as supporting the generation of renewable technologies without, at the same time, safeguarding the land, water, livelihood rights of communities where the critical minerals required for green technology components are being extracted. Sustainable conflict-sensitive financing is also critical and something to keep an eye on, for sure. Yeah, definitely agreed. We have quite some things to keep an eye on. So, of course, I think that the two of us may have some bias as two of the organizers behind the conference, but overall, BCSC 2022 generated a lot of momentum going into COP. And of course, our six key takeaways. One, disproportionate impacts require a shifting of resources and knowledge exchange. Two, joint approaches across sectors, nations, and communities are integral. Three, inclusivity, equity, and diversity is crucial. Four, better financing and access to funds is key. Five, more locally informed research and data transparency is needed. And finally, six, a common language for climate action and the security community must be developed. Yes, I couldn't have summed it up better, Alex. Maybe one last point to add is obviously the Climate for Peace initiative, which has been at the heart of the BCSC. And I'm really excited to see where this is leading <laughs> and also which concrete projects will come out of this. So we'll see next year, next BCSC, what has happened so far. I think that hopefully the next time we sit down and have another recap, we'll have a lot of exciting things to build off of. And thank you so much once again, Alina, for joining us so we could recap the conference together and look to the future. Thanks for having me. So this was the Climate Diplomacy Podcast. We will be back with another episode in a few weeks. Follow our latest updates on Twitter at Climate Diplo. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, goodbye.